to you about the importance of color in black and white photography, specifically color management and the power of using color to produce spectacular photographs. Let me see if I have this all set up the way I wanted it. I have a fancy keynote, that's why. One sec. Okay. These are the five questions that I always, always, always get asked. The first question is, did you see the photographs in black and white? The second one is, what makes a good black and white photograph? The third is, when, when did you take, when did you know the picture was going to be black and white? Next, how come my black and white photographs don't look as good as your black and white photographs, and can you teach me how to see the photograph in black and white? My goal is to answer all of those questions. So the question, the first question I get, and I'll go through this quick, is did you see the photograph in black and white? Okay, first we need to define what a black and white image is. And so to do that, Let's take a look at, hold on one second, I'm going to escape out of this, it be easier. Let's take a look at what that means. We have the film world, which is an LAB world, and the digital world is an RGB world. And what that means simply is this, is that the film world is logarithmic. Okay, and what that means is that it's nonlinear. And in being nonlinear, the best way to describe that would be if I had a cup of coffee and I put a packet of sugar in the cup of coffee, it would taste sweet. If I put two packets of sugar in a cup of coffee, it wouldn't taste twice as sweet, it would taste sweeter. That's because human perception is logarithmic and it's nonlinear. That two plus two doesn't necessarily equal four with regards to the way in which we perceive things and the way in which film recorded things. Now, in the world of digital we print on paper and in that world um, it's the world of black and white. So black and white means literally black ink white paper. The digital world is an RGB world so gray in the digital world is composed of equal values of red, green, and blue. So that makes gray a color. If you can see it with your eye as Matisse said it's a color. And so with that what's important to keep in mind is that you're dealing with color, that you should never, ever, ever, when you're making a black and white image from a digital capture, ever leave the color world. That there are some differences in the way in which film and digital work, and that's important to pay attention to what those differences are. Because the dogma of film sometimes causes major problems in perception of what it is that you're trying to accomplish in digital we can produce a better looking image digitally than we can we could back in the silver days with regards to detail depth of black dynamic range and all sorts of things that we we want sharpness of the image just based on the delta e of film lenses and silver paper we have incredible advantages the difference between the two in my humble opinion is an aesthetic one the like of a metallic look of paper versus one of a more pigmented ink look of paper. So if your bent is, I like the more metallic look, then that's a film aesthetic. And in digital, they're trying to come closer and closer and closer to producing substrates. See, in digital, we don't have paper anymore. We have substrates. and We don't take pictures. We capture them. And we output them onto media, which always seems a bit much for me. So. Um, so the, the paper that you print on is they're striving to make it more more like silver. And what I want to talk about is an overview of how to perceive and conceptualize creating a digital image from a color capture. So let's take a look at that. As I said, human perception is logarithmic, therefore it's nonlinear. In a non, in a non logarithmic world and therefore a linear world, if you had that same cup of coffee and you put a packet of sugar in the coffee, it will taste sweet. If you put a second packet of sugar into the coffee, the cup of coffee would taste twice as sweet. Now that's important because that's predictable. 
And because it's predictable, an RGB color space is easier to work in than an LAB color space. And that we do things differently in digital. For example, the zone system for exposure is not as necessary in a sense as it was with film, where you would move things forward and backwards based on how you would develop it and how you would expose it. Those type of multiple exposures or changes in exposure are done in HDR. You would do those with multiple captures because you, you want to pay attention to something called ETTR, which is exposed to the right. And What that theory says in photography is that two-thirds of a file's information exists in the first stop of data. So to underexpose an image means that you potentially are clipping a lot of data. So you're just exposing for shadows at that point in which you would add into the picture, or you're exposing for highlights, which you would add into the picture. That's the realm more of high, di high dynamic range photography, whereas a zone system, you would pick where you wanted zone 5 to fall, and then you would expose and develop, overexpose, underdevelop. Things are a little bit different here. Does not mean that the zone system is not applicable to photography. It's very applicable with the discussion of printing and what to look at when it comes to a print. So the way that I like to look at a black and white image in a digital world is I like to call it a chromatic grayscale because equal values of red, green, and blue make gray. And if it matters anywhere, it matters most in the digital world with regards to calibration and color management because I may not know what a red is, but I most certainly know what a gray is. I take a picture of something and it's red. I know that it is a red, but I may not necessarily know which red that is, but I certainly know what gray is. And I'm going to show you in a second what that all means. But to get us all on the same page, I think that this little demo is necessary. One of the problems I see when I discuss this or teach this or work with people to produce better chromatic grayscales is that color spaces and profiles and what they mean are a literary event. That we say, oh, well, it's sRGB, oh, it's, it's Adobe RGB, it's Pro Photo RGB. What exactly does that mean? We just see them as letters, but we don't know what they mean. This piece of software is called ColorThink, and what I can do is I can look at color spaces. What you're looking at here is you're looking at the color space sRGB. sRGB was designed for the web, and it was designed specifically for the web to um, pick up skin tones. That's where its primary focus is. And there are some applications for it in photography. For example, if you're a portrait social photographer, a wedding photographer, and you're using um, machines that use a chemical approach, not an ink approach to photography, like a Durst Lambda, um, a Poli printer, those types of printers, then sRGB is a good idea. Why? Because it guarantees you a good skin tone. For the web, it guarantees that the skin tones fall into a place where we can see them. However, if you're printing on inkjet, it's not necessarily the most optimum color space to work in. It's also not the most optimum color space to work in on your images that you take off the camera. You want to work in as big a color space as possible, which I'll show you in a second. So let's take a look at sRGB, and let's take a look at, let's pull up a photo to look at, let's look at this photograph right here of Alcatraz. I want you to see this picture with its sunset of Alcatraz. So let's get out of that and let's take a look at that in software. So this is what that image looks like in color thing. So I turn off sRGB. What you can see is that some of the colors fall out of the gamut of sRGB. So these colors would posterize. They would just print as a blotch in sRGB. Now if I go to Adobe RGB, let's lower the opacity here. Even Adobe RGB is not big enough for some of those 
colors. Now, if you notice, Adobe RGB shares on two of the three tri-stimulus values a great deal of, of information. On the red and the blue part of it, for a good part of it, it shares the same part. It isn't until we get into the mixture of green into this that what happens is that the color space truly expands. So let's go to Profoto RGB. Now, Profoto RGB pretty much contains absolutely everything that that file has, except we have a problem. And the problem is that there is no printer that can print Profoto RGB. So what does that make Profoto RGB in your workflow? Why is it important? And why does this matter for black and white images? Because let me show you what a black and white image looks like in the grand scheme of the grand scheme. Pay close attention to this area right here. So let's look at our black and white image. You see how I have something happening there? So basically all of the image data that is left, the colors of this image, fall on the neutral axis, the L axis. So a black and white image makes sRGB look like Profoto. But why do we need, and let's take a look at that image, so we know what we're talking about. This is the image we're discussing right here of the lovely Lilan. And this is what the image looks like in color before conversion. So let's take a look at both. This is the color of the image that produced that black and white image. And if I put it in sRGB, for the most part, this image fits in that color space, which would make sense because it's a skin tone image. Now, why do I want to work in Profoto, even though I know that I'm going to be potentially printing in a color space smaller than that? The reason is simple. It has to do with one of the if you get anything out of this webinar, please take note of this. Um, this is one of the few written in stone rules that we're not at a pay grade to change, and it's this. All artifacting is cumulative and may be multiplicative. And the reason why you want to work on your images in 16-bit pro photo, knowing full well that you're making a chromatic grayscale image in which when you're done, you will have abstracted all of the color out and leave, you will remove the distraction of the color and just leave the abstraction of the image and so that all the color will be removed out is that you want to minimize and negate artifacting. You want to minimize accumulation and you want to negate multiplication where the artifacting multiplies on itself. Because the color space is so big, the artifacting falls in areas that the printer cannot print, that the monitor cannot show. And so the goal is living in the world of 2% when you're working on an image. And what that means is if it gives me a 2% quality increase, I'm going to do it. So by having multiple layers in an image instead of trying to do everything onto one image, because what that does is it negates multiplication, that I'm not cooking things in and then multiplying and cooking that in and multiplying that, that I'm just adding in with no amplification of multiplication that I can minimize my artifact. Where does this matter? Let's say you have a 5.5 megapixel camera or a 12.5 megapixel camera and you want to make a 44 by 36 inch print. You have a better chance of success if you work in a way in which minimizes artifact. Now, let's take a look at this shot. Now, this is Another shot, of my boy in Peru. So let's look at sRGB. See how much of this is out of gamut? Here, 
and here. So this would not be a candidate to produce this unless I clip the color down. Let's take a look at Adobe RGB. Right up to the edge of Adobe RGB. So that would be perfect. Now let's take a look at a paper profile. And just bear with me for a second. I'm going to get to black and white in a moment. I just want to get us all on the same page. Now, this is a profile for the Epson uh, P7000-9000 on um, the Legacy Platine. And what you should notice is that the profile, the printer, is capable of printing colors bigger than Adobe RGB. So I can produce colors that I can't see on the monitor, on my Adobe RGB monitor, which will change the way things look. But Profoto can contain that. Okay. Where would you want to do that? I mean, I want to print, for skin tone I print in Adobe RGB. This is the way that I work. And in nature, I have a tendency to produce images in Profoto RGB if they're color. And the reason why I do that is because nature never is as real as we saw it. We tend to always push color a little bit. Sunsets tend to be more sunset than sunset. So with that, I'm going to use the advantage of the profile and the advantage of the color space. And with regard to people, that color has to be very color accurate. I will tend to use um, Adobe RGB when I'm printing inkjet, and if I'm going to go to Poli or Durst Lambda or something like that, I will tend to make sRGB, and when I go to the internet, I will make sRGB. This is important to understand, that color spaces matter, and that color profiling matters, that having the printer profiled produces the most optimum print. For me, the goal is always the print. So let's take a look, then, at, I'm sure if many of you are familiar with this chart, we have to come up with a definition <coughs> of what a chromatic grayscale image is. So let's start. Chromatic grayscale image has a white, a black, a middle gray, and a grayscale ramp in between. So that it goes from black of paper to white of paper, gray all the way through to middle gray. So we have a white, a black, and a gray. Now, this is CMY at 100%, and this is RGB at 255, 255, 255. Here is the big difference between film and digital. And it will sound like kind of like Groundhog Opposite Day, the way I describe this. If I shot this picture with film, all of these colors would be different grays. But if I shot equal values of red, green, and blue digitally and then made it chromatic grayscale, all of these colors will be the same gray. Let me show you. Let's create a hue and saturation adjustment layer. And what we're going to simply do is this. How about that? We're going to misbehave. Let's try that one more time. There we go. I've removed all of the color out of the image. That's the first way we've ever done a black and white, right? Everybody says, oh, I'll just take all the color out. That makes it black and white. What do you see happen here? Is that all of those colors that were different are now all the same gray. So what has occurred is by removing 100% of the color, what we've accomplished is we have lost one point of density. That, they, that we've lost one point of density, and in that one point of density loss, lost two-thirds of our information in the photograph. Why does this matter? Let's take a look 
at the lovely Lelon. Let's look at her in channels. This is the red channel. By our definition, does it meet a black and white image, chromatic grayscale? It does. It's got a black, a white, and a grayscale ramp all the way through. Now, is this different than that? Yes. That green contains the mid-tone mid structures of an image, whereas red contains the upper end of contrast, the creamier ends of the skin tone. And then if we look at blue, blue is the lower end, the darker end of contrast. So this is different than that, this is different than that, and this is different than that. So I have three expressions of the same image structure by removing all of the color out of the image. What happens is I, I get a chromatic grayscale, but that's a blue channel, that's a green channel, that's a red channel. So what occurred is we have successfully lost two-thirds of the file's data. Let me show you this in another way. Let's take a look at lab. So if I come in here and I go to image mode, lab color, you should see absolutely nothing happened. So this meets our definition, the L star channel, the lightness channel. It's got a black, a white, and a gray, and everything in between. This is the A channel. Is there anything that is visually useful for you to pull out image structure from this representation of the image? Perhaps not. And the same here, that these two things are not useful. Now look at this number down here. Okay, 17.1 is the file size, megabytes. When I remove the two color channels, what happens is I lose two-thirds of the file's data. What I am left with is just the luminance channel. So what happens when you remove the color that way and not use it is that you dump two-thirds of the spectral relational data in that file that you can use. That you lose two-thirds of the way in which the image captured was captured of image data. That the blue holds image data differently than the green. And the red holds image data differently than the green and the blue and so on. So what you want to do when you're working in digital is you want to preserve next rule. You never, ever, ever want to leave the RGB color space to produce a chromatic grayscale image. Next, and I know that this is not something a lot of people want to hear. The last place in the world that you should do a chromatic grayscale conversion is in a raw processor. Because converting an image, to first get to the image, you have to produce the perfect image. So let's take a look at everything that goes into making that image. So this is our chromatic grayscale image. And these are all of the steps to get me there. So let's look at just the retouch steps so that I can make my point. This is what the image started like. This is all of the retouching that went in for skin repair. This is all of the steps that went in for eye direction to make it so that what I have is an image 
that draws the eye that I want it the way I want it to go. So the first thing you have to do in making a, a chromatic grayscale image, in my humble opinion, in my little slice of reality, is you have to make a perfect color image. And it's based off of an observation I made working in Hollywood for 15 years, photographing um, actors. And I shot over 6,000 rolls of black and white film a year for 15 years. And one of the observations that always struck me was, even though I was looking through the viewfinder in color, I had put black and white film in my camera and I was making a black and white image, but the picture I was seeing was in color, which always tripped me out. It's like you had to learn that this lipstick would be that gray. In digital, I can shoot the color image and then have control over everything in the image. Now, you use different films for different things back in the day. And the reason why you use different films for different things is something called a tonal reproduction curve, that each film had its own unique way of recording the collision between red, green, and blue. For me, for shooting portraiture, my favorite combination was um, HP5 Plus rated at 200 ISO, and then I used what is referred to by the manufacturer, a deep tank replenishment system, which was D76 developer, that I would add back some aspect of the developer so that I could mellow out the developer to produce a nice, smooth negative that I could then print. Here, and I picked HP 5 Plus because of the way in which it handled skin tone. For photographing nature, I preferred uh, Tri-X um, 320 rated at 250 so that I was again overexposing and underdeveloping, that I was creating a look based off the tap dance between exposure and chemistry. In digital, it's a little bit different in that we get back to exposed to the right, which means that a slightly overexposed image sometimes is better for you. You just don't want to blow the highlights out because it gives you more detail. More information, more detail means that you have more nooks and crannies to play with. Lightening and darkening an image is very easy to do, much easier to do in the digital darkroom than it ever was in the film darkroom. So the first rule is to get the image correct in color and make it the best possible color image you can make it. Black and white is not an afterthought. It's not like, oh, it didn't work in color, so uh, I'll make it a black and white and call it art. Black and white is the only thought. I've never met a photograph that I didn't know at the moment I captured it that it was not a black and white. I've all, when I take a picture, you look at it, it just tells me that it's a black and white. And the reason why I know that is that the color gets in the way of the gesture of the photograph. The more important concept, I think, is the Maisellian, J. Maisel concept of the three key elements to any photograph are light, gesture, and color. And of course, because I can't leave well enough alone, I have four, light, gesture, color, and time. But let's look at Maisel's light, gesture, and color. Light and color are obvious. You see them, but it's gesture that's the most important. It's gesture that's the most telling. And if there's any criteria for a black and white image, for me, is that the gesture is so strong in the image that the color takes away from the expression of that gesture, that the color masks the import of the gesture. So it's a removing of the distraction of color so that you can have the abstraction of the gesture of the image. I, I've listened to a lot of people talk about what makes a great black and white photograph. Um, it's got to have contrast. It has to have drama. Well, that makes a great photograph. They all have to have contrast and they all have to have drama. Um, do some images lend themselves more to black and white other or chromatic grayscale than others? Yes, they tend to be the ones with the strongest gesture that also have contrast and drama. You don't want a flat photograph and you don't want one that's boring. That's a passport photograph. What you want is a photograph in which the entire landscape of the person is captured in one moment, that you tell the story of that person's moment or that experience in a second. The picture, there's a saying, a picture speaks a thousand words, but a thousand words will never convey what goes on in a photograph. So, because of how it hits you emotively. So black and white, 
the other reason why chromatic grayscale black and white images are so strong to us is because think about it when we're living in the jungle when do we see black and white late at night when we're at our most vulnerable there are creatures in the jungle that can see better at night than we can so when we're looking in our color world and we see a chromatic grayscale black and white image that attacks a different part of our visual experience and opens us up to a vulnerability that we are kind of hardwired to be when we're in that realm that's the other reason why black and white images chromatic grayscale images are more powerful images now let's take a look at the question and I'll show you how to do this one um, did you see this image in black and white so this is the final master base image okay this is what the image will look like when I do chromatic grayscale but this is what the image looks adjusted in color so let me ask you do you see color that way when you look through the viewfinder because to be able to make this black and white image and let's do it this way because it'll be easier To be able to make this black and white image, you would have to have perceived the color this way. What you're looking at is you're looking at an image-specific tonal reproduction curve that is also image structure specific. This is my theory of black and white conversion, and this is why I think that digital, for me, as somebody that has been doing black and white since the age of seven, and am a large format 4x5, 8x10, 11x14 photographer throughout most of my career. Um, think that digital black and white gives me a better look in black and white. Because what I can do is instead of having to have a sheet of film that's one tonal reproduction curve, what I can do is I can create a tonal reproduction curve specifically for the eyes, for this hair, for this skin tone. Now, the only way I think that you would see a human being like this is if you were in the movie Twilight and you needed to feed. So we don't see color this way. So the answer to the question, did you see that picture in black and white? No, I saw that picture in color. But what happens is the gesture is so strong that it needs to be made of black and white. Now, for this particular shoot, the whole purpose of this shoot was to produce a classic looking Harrell like photograph which means that when I was walking into this shoot I already knew that what I wanted to do was to produce a chromatic grayscale image and this is just using a technique which I'll show you called um, excuse me film and filter which is where you use hue and saturation in the color blend mode to produce different um, images for different types of color. So let's look at these individually. And then I'll come in and show you how to do this. So if we look at this, this is just her jacket, her face, and so on, that I build this image up. Now the way that I do this is simple. And this is going to be a I think hopefully a, a good demonstration to show you why one should use calibration and calibration software. Now, on all of my computers, on all my monitors, and I'm looking at my studio right now, one, two, three, four, five, six monitors, on all of them I have I1 devices that measure the ambient light that I calibrate. I travel with a calibration device so that I can calibrate my monitor in the field. Here's why that matters. We're going to produce a white layer, a black layer, and then a layer that is neutral gray. 
The other thing to get in the habit of whenever you do something in Photoshop is to give your layers meaningful names. Now, so we agree that that's white, we agree that that's black, and we agree that that's gray. Okay. Remember when I said equal values of red, green, and blue produce gray? So 255, 255, 255 is equal values of red, green, and blue. I'm going to put it in the color blend mode. What do I have? I have a chromatic grayscale image. Let's do this with 000, zero, zero equal values of red, green, and blue. We'll put it in the color blend mode. Again, no difference because equal values of red, green, and blue produce gray, which means that in the digital world, gray is a color. And if you want to get the most optimum grayscale images, what you want to do is you want to send a RGB file to the printer and print from an RGB file, not a grayscale file. So let's take a look at the last one. Again, equal values of red, green, and blue. Let's leave that one on just to make our point. In the color blend mode, produce gray. So let's take a look at why color management matters. I'm going to move this up three points. Or excuse me. I'm going to move this. Let's go back. I'm going to move the green up three points. Now when I fill this layer with that color, is it gray? It's a neutral green, but it's not gray. So as you can see specifically over here, if we look, do you see how this picked a gray cast versus this? This is neutral, 128, 128, 128. By just moving the green up three points, not a lot, I produced an image that now has a green cast. We may not know exactly if that red is that red without calibration. It just looks red. But we certainly know when a neutral is not neutral. So we know that when this is not gray, which means that our image will produce, that we produce and print, will be green cast, not gray. It will not be what we're looking for, which is a chromatic grayscale. So if color management matters anywhere, it matters most in the area in which we don't have a lot of color. It matters most where we have an area of where the colors are supposed to be neutral. Now if you can get a monitor and a print to produce this, then all the other colors fall in line. So it's very important to make sure that your monitor is calibrated. When do I calibrate my monitor? You can set the calibration up for once a week. I calibrate my monitors whenever I know that I am going to be doing some work, mission critical, image critical work on an image. So I come in, calibrate my monitors, make a cup of coffee and sit down and they're done. And the reason why I do that is peace of mind. You can set it up any way you want, but the devices are automated in such a way that they're designed as close as possible to make themselves go away. Now it's an entire system from calibrating the monitor to the print that you want to have a paper profile that you can load in so that you can see on the monitor what it looks like and that you can guarantee that you get the optimum amount of print that the printer can print, that the right amounts of ink are laid down and that the quality of the image is best. So manufacturers provide printer profiles. You can make printer profiles. I travel with a device called a Color Monkey Photo. Kind of looks like a excuse me, tape measure. And the reason why I do that is so that if I'm in the field, which I am frequently, what I can do is I can build a profile that is specific to the printing device that I'm working on. And with that technology, what I can do is I can build a profile that is specific to the image. 
Is it as good as my bigger stuff? It's not as good as my ISIS, and it's not necessarily as good as my i1 Pro, but it's certainly better than anything else that I could make without it. So I prefer to travel with those devices. I can use that to calibrate my monitor. I can also use that to calibrate a projector should I need to do that. So that the device helps me in the field, and I travel with that device. I'm a big proponent of making sure that you're calibrated. You should make it, I think, in my humble opinion, that you are the weakest link in your technology, that you are the one that is the weakest link. Now, let me show you how to quickly convert an image. We're going to do the film and filter approach, which is incredibly simple. Russell Preston Brown created this one. It's a piece of brilliance. First thing we're going to do is we are going to desaturate the image. Call this film. Now, I'm going to take another one and create another hue saturation layer. We'll call this filter. Now, watch what happens when I change the hue here. Nothing, right? And the reason why we have nothing is because there is no color. We've already removed the color. One of the issues in the way in which we're taught is something that Kierkegaard said, which is we live life forwards, but frequently we experience it backwards. And the problem with teaching it is that we're looking from the top down. So obviously, color has nothing to do with this, because obviously, if we're looking at it from the top down, what we have is what matters most is contrast. That by adjusting the contrast, that's what makes drama. Okay, but let's take a look at what happens when I take my film and filter and move it down here and move my hue. You see how the image changes? The reason why that is, is that we're looking at it from the bottom up. So instead of looking at it from the top down, we're looking at it from the bottom up. And at this point, what we know is color matters. By controlling the color of the image, what I can do, and let's start with filter 1. Fill this with black, B, 50%. that I can come back in here and create another hue and saturation adjustment layer. And use that to darken upper lips and to create drama in the shadows over here. Let's create another one. Let's go to 50% creamy upper skin tone. Okay, so we've produced is a lovely looking black and white image. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So my question to you is, do you see color that way? No, but by controlling the color, by determining what happens to the color, you can produce a tonal reproduction curve that is specific to the image. Basically, you can create your own emulsion in digital that is image specific that goes to the will of your vision. It's all about your vision. And having the ability to create an image that meets your vision is spectacular.
we have such huge advantages today in digital. The zone system was based on off of a 10-stop dynamic range um, idea in which in actuality seven stops are usable. In today's film we have a 14.2 stop dynamic range. Human vision has 22. It moves up of a hundred stop scale but it has 22 stops of dynamic range. We're approaching human vision. We have the ability to access more information. We have sharper, better images that have better color and we have greater control. So by simply creating multiple adjustment layers that are hue and saturation, what we can do is produce an image that accesses all of the information that was captured and produce a more visually appealing image with greater image structure and greater tonality. And that is my two cents worth. And if there are, and I'm sure there are, um, many, many questions, the time is nigh. Because I left enough time, right? I have 11 minutes. Okay. Then let's take a look at another way to look at stuff. Let's go back to this image. And let's take a look at, now let's introduce just a curve into this, where we're going to use just curves onto the image. There we go. So now that we have this, we can do some more fine-tuning with this image with just curves. So what happens if I go to the strong contrast blend mode or strong contrast and I select screen and I go command J and then I select multiply. There you go. Screen doubles or ha doubles or screen halves the density, multiply doubles the density. So we're going to go alt and we're going to go screen. Okay. Now, what I can do here is produce. some questions. One sec. Robert asks, are you using the normal blend mode on the hue saturation layers? I am using the color blend mode on the film hue saturation layer and then I'm using normal on all the other ones on filter one, two, and three. This is not to say that you can't use those and the reason why you could use those is if you want to affect greater change on the color. Sometimes that works. Not all the time, and most of the time it's normal. But the only one that matters in this approach, and this is the quick approach to find out what you want to do with an image, is to use for the film um, aspect, you use the this one here. Film is in the color blend mode, see? and then the rest of these are in normal. But let's take a look at what happens if I switch that from normal to color. Do you see how you do get a change? So one of the things that you might want to consider, one of the things that I consider, is looking at what that does. So let's take a look at what it does from a color standpoint. 
So it deepens the magenta. So it may work to my advantage. The thing to keep in mind is to use all of them. All tools are open, all options. It's a street fight. How many rules in a street fight? There are no rules. Okay, um, Dean asked, is adjusting color in HSL in Lightroom nearly the same process? No, you really can't do this in Lightroom. What you would do in Lightroom is you would use the black and white adjustment layer. And let me show you what that looks like and why I would not suggest doing that. Um, the problem with the black and white adjustment layer, and this is the same in um, Photoshop as it is in Lightroom, is that you have three colors made up of one color, and you have three colors made up of two colors. So you have red, green, and blue, which are your primaries of light, and then you have yellow, cyan, and magenta, which are your secondaries of light. Uh, and Vicky, I'll get to the printing space in a second. So what happens here is if we're using this right here, I can adjust the red, let's use the scrubby slider, okay, and that's great, but the problem is that if I adjust the yellow, I also adjust the red because the yellow is made up of red and green. So in this instance, having six sliders is not as good as three sliders. You'd be better off with the channel mixer. My personal hum humble opinion is Lightroom is not the place to make a black and white chromatic grayscale image. Photoshop is. There are other tools like Silver Effects Pro, like Mac Fun's Tonality, and the like, where you can make them into adjustment layers that you can control all the bells, whistles, and then you can blend them together. Lightroom is great for a lot of things. Converting an image to chromatic grayscale, in my opinion, is not the most optimum way to do it. Um, how long did it take to produce this image? George, they take as long as they take. Um, <laughs> some, some images are a half an hour, some images are a lifetime. I have one image I'm still working on 10 years after I started it because I'm still not happy with it. Um, I try to make things as simple as possible but no simpler and each image is its own call. For me, I'm, uh, I tend to be more of a fine artist these days so I can spend more time on my image. My question would be to you to ask is what would you rather have? Ten images that you got out real quick or one image that every time somebody looks at it they go holy crap that's amazing. So that's what I I want to do. Ah, to define gesture Um, everything has gesture. The best way to describe gesture is look at a flower that's opening. You see how the, the, the petals are moving out. That's gesture. Or the turn of a head. Um, hold on one second. Let me see if I can find this for you. Uh, Jay Maisel has an incredible discussion of this on the Internet that he did for PDN which I would suggest to look out for. What I'll do is I will um, send that off to X-Rite and they can post that up with this. As to what monitors I prefer, um, I use BenQ. All my, I have BenQ and Wacom Cintiqs. The Cintiqs are the monitors that I do my production work on that I draw. My color approval monitors are BenQ. Um, for color accuracy, I think BenQ does the best job. For workflow productivity, there is nothing better than a Wacom Cintiq. It's worth the price of admission, and they are all 4K and Adobe RGB. So Robert asked, does the color space and image is captured and limit the color space used for the output? If you're capturing in RAW, no, because you make the color space up in the sense of a RAW file is a linearized black and white file. And then you assign a color space to it. But there's actually more information in the RAW file than Adobe RGB or sRGB. The reason why you set your camera to sRGB and why 
camera manufacturers, and this is for every one of them, does not allow S or a Pro Photo RGB as a choice is beyond me, is to set that JPEG up that is the thumbnail in the camera so that you can create a histogram. So you can make a judgment call off of it. There's more information to be had in that file than you can see in the histogram from Adobe RGB. So if you're shooting RAW, no. If you're shooting JPEG, yes. If you're shooting JPEG, set it to Adobe RGB, and then in post-production software, should you need to dumb it down, then bring it to sRGB. What's important to keep in mind with regards to color spaces is you can only go down, you can't go up. I can't go from sRGB to Adobe to Pro Photo RGB because there's no information there. But I can go from Pro Photo RGB, which has got a lot of information, to Adobe RGB, which has less information than Profoto, and then sRGB, which has less information than Adobe RGB. <clears throat> How do I address depth of field? I think the best definition of defining depth of field and what is a circle of confusion is Michael Reitman's definition of circles of confusion, which is a bunch of photographers sitting around a table trying to define depth of field. Depth of field is different in its expression in digital than it is in film. Now, here's the reason why. Film had, um, lenses have the capability of recording 200 line pair of resolution. And what that means is that they can record 200 black and white lines per centimeter. Now, film has the ability of uh, the best film in the world between 150 and 175 line pair. So what that means is that film had less resolution than the lens. The best paper in the entire world with the most amount of silver, the most amount of cadmium, the most amount of zinc, and the most amount of tin back in the day when you put all that stuff in it, could produce 75 line pair. So what that means is that anything above 75 line pair of resolution is lost, which is why there was an illusion of depth of field, which is if I stop the lens down, I got more things in focus. In reality, what occurred is when you stop the lens down, you received more things at 75 line pair. And since they were all of the same line pair, 75, that they appeared to be in the same focus. Now, in digital, the lens sees 200, the sensor sees 200, and the printer can print 300 line pair, which means that the output device has greater resolution capability than the file you're sending it. So depth of field has a different thing. Physics is really, really clear on this, which is that the only thing that is in focus in a fixed lens system, which is what almost every lens except for a tilt-shift lens is on a DSLR, the only thing that's in focus is that which the lens is focused upon and anything that crosses the plane of focus. So first misnomer of depth of field, stopping the lens down gives you more stuff in focus. No. A better way to perceive it, I think, is that stopping the lens down gives you a greater area of acceptable out of focus. That the only thing that's in focus is that which the lens is physically focused upon. Now, if you want multiple objects in focus, that means that you have to have multiple photographs of those images. Another misnomer about depth of field is that um, focal length actually has something to do with depth of field. That's not correct. It's angle of view is what has to do with depth of field. All lenses have the same depth of field. It's the angle of view that matters. Where the perception of a wide angle lens having greater depth of field than a telephoto lens is the smaller an object is, the more in focus it will appear to be. The bigger the object is, the more out of focus it will appear to be. So keeping that in mind, the, I think the most important parts of contemplating an image at this point is not what's in focus but what's out of focus, because only one thing in your photograph is in focus, that which is the lens is focused upon and anything that crosses the plane of focus, everything else is falling into the area of acceptable out of focus. That's called bokeh, and bokeh is the Japanese concept of quality of blur. So let me look at a couple of more of these whilst I'm 
at this. Let's see, this is just true. Michael Speak asks, this is just terrific information and enormous food for thought. On an image like this, would you ever take it into Silver FX Pro 2? That's a loaded question. Um, I was employee number two of the company that invented Silver FX Pro 2, and I was a photographer that was used as the test pilot for Silver FX Pro 2. So I do hope that that answers your question as to how often and frequently I use Silver FX Pro 2. What I want to show here, and why I choose to show you this way, is that this is a complete Photoshop only demo, not using third party plugins. I would recommend doing this. Um, I use a multiple Silver FX Pro approach, one where I balance one for red, green, blue, and neutral so that I can move all around. But what I want to show here is the power of what digital has in comparison to the power of film, that you can control the color aspects of the image and therefore control the image structure of those color channels. That's what's important. Um, Barbara, to answer your question, right now I am madly, passionately in love with the Epson Legacy Platine and um, I also am a huge fan of the Cold Press Natural. But the Legacy Platine for doing black and white images is a religious experience. It's gorgeous, just absolutely gorgeous paper. I know I skipped somebody else's question, but I can't pull that up, and I apologize for that. Um, so yeah, the whole thing I want you to get is that, the, to answer those questions, did I see the picture in black and white? No, I saw it in color. Um, how do I, how come my pictures look better than your pictures in black and white? because I use color to control my images and the image structure. I'm giving you basically the core secret to how I work. Um, can I teach you to see black and white see black and white color? No, I can't. You tell me. Can you? Do you see that way? But what you can see is that if the image is so strong that it pulls you, that you can see it, that, that the color starts pulling away from what you want to say in the photograph, that makes it a candidate for color. So what are you actually sending to the printer? Something in grayscale or 16-bit? Um, I'm sending it 16-bit and because here's, here's the crazy. When I photograph pictures of people in full color, I tend to print those Adobe RGB. Why? So that I can guarantee a consistency in skin tone. Because the problem with printing in pro photo a person's face is if they're somebody of color or if they're Asian what happens is that though that part of what pro photo can print and the profile can print that I can't see gets amplified so the skin tone may become more yellow orange than I would like it to be so I tend to print out of Adobe RGB for that for nature landscapes I tend to print out a pro photo why because I want all the color I can get because it doesn't matter what color space I'm in per se with black and white because of how small that is I don't convert it to Adobe RGB I leave it in pro photo and the reason why I leave it in pro photo is that's simply one less step I have to do so it's a workflow efficiency thing you can print that out of pro photo SMPTE, sRGB Adobe RGB what matters when you print is to do the following two things with every print. Make sure that black point compensation is selected and make sure that you're printing out of uh, the relative color metric rendering intent and then when you set up Photoshop or Lightroom that you set it up for those things. Now if you're working with Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom's uh, develop module uh, they have a number in there which is 240 I believe that is a very 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 old resolution number for Epson printers Epson printers want to see 360 PPI and I would set it to 360 PPI and the reason for that is that the printer head works in multiples of 90 so the next one that goes down would not be 240 it would be 270 so because of multiples of 90. So set it for 360 and should you dumb it down, go ahead. 
Um, Doug asked, do you create an ICC profile for black and white? I'm printing on an Epson printer, um, and I use the advanced black and white driver. And what I would recommend is that you use the advanced black and white driver. That is probably produces the best chromatic grayscale prints that I have ever seen. Uh, John asks, are you painting on the filter layer? You're painting on the filter layer. <coughs> Excuse me. You never paint on the film layer. The filter layer is the one that creates the chromatic grayscale. The, fil the film layers are the ones that allow you to um, bend the image. Now, Jim asks, did you refer to Russell Brown Adobe as developer of this technique? Yes, multiple times. I think it is one of the most inspired techniques that Russell Brown has ever come up with. And to tell you the truth of this, when I was writing from Oz to Kansas, when I first saw this technique, I didn't think it was that big a deal until I started playing with it. And I went, oh my god, once again, the genius of Dr. Brown has come out and completely figured out something in which, you know, I thought I had figured out before him, but he figured it out before me. And then my applications of it are to multiple channel mixers, which is a technique that I developed, and then taking that even one step further in the development of Silver Effects Pro 2 was we had a conversation of trying to put this multiple color technique into the plugin, and the discussion was that to put it into the plugin and do it would make the plugin too cumbersome and too too difficult to use. So my workaround for it when I was trying to show what I was doing was to create multiple um, Silver Effects Pro plugins balanced to red, green, and blue. But no, the film and filter technique um, is Russell Brown's, and Russell Brown should get total credit, and I always make it a point. So I'm sorry if you didn't catch that, um, but yes, Russell Brown, Russell Brown, Russell Brown. And he makes a good cream soda, too. Always glad to help. So yeah, if you have any questions, um, email them to the webinar and they'll get to me and I'll be more than happy to answer them. I hope this was helpful. Um, black and white is my passion and if you love black and white at the level I love black and white, I am always at the end of an email to help out because I think that that is the most beautiful way to take a picture. So thank you.